one of the things I've thought about for a long time is that I've been trying to figure out what gives people's lives meaning and tragedy gives life its negative meaning and nobody disputes that even if you're nihilistic you're not going to dispute the fact that tragedy gives life negative meaning so when nihilists say that life is meaningless that isn't exactly what they mean they mean that life is suffering but there isn't anything transcendent about it that you could set against that suffering that's nihilism it's not that life is meaningless that would just be neutral it's like no one believes that and they certainly don't act like they believe it in order to have any positive meaning in your life you have to have identified a goal and you have to be working towards it and there is a technical reason for that and the technical reason as far as I can tell is that the circuitry that produces the kind of positive emotion that people really like is only activated when you're proceeding towards a goal that you value and so that means that if you don't have a goal that you value you can't have any positive emotion so technically that's the incentive reward system and it's the underlying circuitry is dopaminergic and when that circuitry is activated then it's part of the exploratory circuit it gives you the sense of being actively engaged in something worthwhile you tend to think of positive emotion as something produced by reward but there's two kinds of positive emotion one is the reward that's associated with satiation and that's consumatory reward and that's the reward you get when you're hungry and you eat but the thing about eating when you're hungry is that it destroys the framework within which you were operating right? it's time to eat well you eat and then that framework's no longer relevant so the consumatory reward eliminates the value framework and then you're stuck with well what are you going to do next and so the consumatory reward has with it its own problems but the incentive reward is constantly what keeps you moving forward and incentive reward because it's dopaminergic also is analgesic literally analgesic so if you're in pain you take opiates and that, that will cut the pain, but so will psychomotor stimulants like cocaine or amphetamines. And so it's literally the case that if you're engaged in something that's engaging and you're working towards a goal, that you're going to feel less pain. And you can see this happening with athletes who, you know, they'll break their thumb or something, or maybe sometimes even their ankle, and they'll keep playing the game. Of course, afterwards they're suffering like mad, but the fact that they're so filled with goal-directed enthusiasm means that well, the pain systems are in some sense shut off. So that's an interesting thing because then you could imagine, I might say, well, how happy you are you that you've made a certain amount of progress? And if you think about it, what you'd say is, well, it depends on how much progress and in relationship to what. So hypothetically, you're gonna be happier if you've made quite a bit of progress towards a really important goal. And then you have to think through what it means for a goal to be really important, because that's not obvious. Now you could say, you're in this class and you're listening to some information and maybe there's two reasons for that you might find the information interesting per se but let's forget about that for a minute you need to listen to the information so that you can do well on the assignments so that you can do well in the class you need to do well in your classes so that you can finish up your degree you need to finish up your degree so that you can find your place in the world you need to do that so that you're financially stable and maybe you can start a family and have a life and that's all part of being a good person, something like that. And so that's a hierarchy of goals and you might say that being a good person would be the thing, however vaguely thought through, that's at the top of that hierarchy. And then when you're doing things that serve that ultimate purpose, then you're gonna find those more meaningful and that meaning is actually produced as a consequence of the engagement of this exploratory circuit that's nested right down in your hypothalamus. It's really, really old. It's as old as thirst and it's as old as hunger. It's really an old system. And so you wanna have that thing activated. I mean, at least from a, well, it isn't only from a hedonic point of view, you know, it isn't a matter of being happy. It's the wrong way of thinking about it. It's much more complicated than that. The problem with the hedonic route, so the pursuit of pure happiness, let's say, is that what makes you happy in the next minute might not be something that will make you happy in the next hour. Well, you know that. There's this comic, what's his name? They called him King of the One-Liners. He talked about drinking wine. He said, don't you know that's gonna cause a hangover? And he said, yeah, at the end, but the beginning and middle are excellent. And so that's really the problem with hedonism, right, is that to pursue something that makes you happy in the immediate present risks sacrificing your, well, many things, but at least, let's say, your hedonism in the medium to long term. And of course, that is one of the major problems with drug use. And alcohol is a really good example of that, because 
whatever hedonic kick you might get from it that moment at night, you're going to pay for almost completely, or maybe even more so, because t the next day you're much more jittery and anxious. And that's a direct consequence of withdrawing from the drug. So when you have a hangover, you're in alcohol withdrawal. So that's how fast you, you get, roughly speaking, addicted to it. And so if you take another drink when you're hungover, it'll cure it. But it's not a very useful cure because all you do is push the inevitable hangover one more step into the future. And so part of the problem with the hedonic answer is happy when exactly and over what period of time and also who's happy because maybe something makes you happy but makes your family miserable. Now you could say, well, I don't care, but you do care if you have to live with your family because they're going to take it out on you. So the impulsive hedonism which is also fostered, say, by positive emotion. It, it tends to put people into a state of the pursuit of short-term hedonism. It's not a good medium to long-term solution. I actually think that's why people evolved conscientiousness, right? Because conscientiousness is not happy. Conscientious people aren't conscientious because it makes them happy. We're starting to think that they're conscientious because they actually feel terrible if they're just sitting around doing nothing. And so it's a way of staving off the stress that's related to enforced leisure, something like that. You know, you, if you know industrious people, some of you are industrious, some of you will have industrious parents, they just can't sit around and do nothing. They have to be working. They don't feel good unless they're working. So, one thing about conscientiousness is that it involves continual sacrifice, right? You're doing difficult things in the present, hypothetically, to make the future better. But that's not driven by hedonism by any stretch of the imagination. And conscientiousness is actually a pretty good predictor of long-term life success in stable societies. Because there's also no point in being conscientious and saving things up and storing things if a bunch of thugs are going to just come in randomly and, and take it all away. So conscientiousness actually only works intelligently in societies that have some medium to long-term stability. You know, because you can get wiped out by hyperinflation too, because hyperinflation kills off the conscientious people. The people who accrue debts are thrilled when hyperinflation kicks in because it wipes out their debts. But, of course, those debts are the things they owe to people who were conscientious enough to save.